camera. Today's May 16th, 2016, and we're at the home of Mr. Dorsey Coleman in Roswell, Georgia. Mr. Coleman's a World War II veteran, and he has kindly agreed to sit with us today and talk to us about his life, his upbringing, his military experience, and what he did after he got out of the military. This is part of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, and Mr. Coleman's story will be recorded and be put on file with both the Atlanta History Center and the Library of Congress. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center. Uh, Sue Verhoff, who is a senior archivist with the History Center, is also here, and Karen Gilbert, who is Mr. Coleman's daughter, is also here and has played a big part in having this whole day arranged for us, and we appreciate that. Mr. Coleman, would you give us your full name and your current address? <coughs> Paul Dorsey Coleman. And when were you born and what city and state? I was born April the 24th, 1923, uh, in what is known as the old Hartscrabble community, which is over on uh, King Road in uh, Back in those days, it just, you know, was, we had route so-and-so. And, -so. and um, the, uh, my original postman delivered the mail in a horse and buggy. Wow. Um, and I remember a lot of times that he'd come to the house and he'd come in, he'd pull up in the backyard and stop and just that old horse would stop and he'd just drop the reins and nothing there. But that horse wouldn't move till he come out there and picked up the reins and, and went. And sometimes uh, he would stay different nights and long route. He would stay with people because it was too, like from, from my house down to the Roswell was three miles and the horse and buggy, that was a long way. So he was welcome to stay with anybody on his route. Gee. And they'd feed him and feed the horse. and. Uh, give him a place to sleep, and the next morning he'd get up and go on his way. Well, how often was the mail delivered? Was it Every that? day. Every day? Every day. Okay. Did you have brothers and sisters? And tell us a little bit about your, your I, parents. There was eight of us. I'm the youngest of eight. I had four bro I mean, three brothers and four sisters. Now, my oldest sister, Elsie, died before I was born. She died when she was eight years old. And then my mother died when I was about a year and a half old. And later on in life, my dad married a, an old maid widow in the neighborhood. But for, oh, I'd say after my sisters all married and left, my dad and I lived just the two of us for three or four years. And we kept house and cooked and mm -hmm. did everything just like normal. Uh, we were dad and I were real close, and uh, we had a pretty big farm, about uh, 75 or 80 acres, and what we, what we were what was called a two-horse farm. We had two mules, and we raised corn, cotton, peas, hay. We raised everything that we needed, uh, and you'd have... Uh, you pick your cotton and you had to take it to Roswell to the gin. And uh, my dad would load the cotton up with them and the wagon up with enough cotton to make a bale of cotton. And he'd leave real early in the morning. And in the damp mornings, if you happen to be awake, you'd hear the hubs of the old wagon popping, going through the old mud holes and whatnot from here down to the gin. Uh, it was, you know, it was, I remember we had a cotton house, right. it was right down here where my driveway comes up now. This was a cotton house. And I was, Dad was loading a load of cotton. I was probably about four or five, and I was back in there playing in the cotton. And there was a guinea wasp nest up there, and I, I bumped that thing, and they got down my shirt. And my, I started hollering, my dad just ripped my shirt off because he didn't know what it was. But then when I got home, I told him, a duck bee stung me. 
So from then on out, I was duck. Get <laughs> <laughs> could get but, rid of that name. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean it. Um, the amazing thing back in those days was, we thought we was poor, but we had plenty. We were, we, the Coleman family was probably one of the most affluent families in the Harshgrove community. Uh, Dad owned his farm about 80 acres. He had a car and two mules and uh, we were, uh, I guess you'd say financially we were one of the most financially fixed families in the whole uh, hard scrabble community. Most everybody around here was tenant farmers. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Carpenter Farms were this big farm back here, all this back in here was Carpenter Farm. And then he had several big farms over across uh, the uh, Crabapple Road mm -hmm. back in there. But those, everybody was tenant farmers uh, and everybody was pub folks. Uh, I never will forget going up to one of our neighbors up here, a tenant farmer, and spent the night and uh, we got up and we had, for breakfast we had cornbread and lard. Cornbread and lard. Yeah, and they were, you know, things were tough. Yeah. I mean they were tough. But uh, nobody in this community went hungry. Uh, everybody looked after everybody else. and. Uh, most everybody just had one cow, but we had two cows. And I know a lot of times my dad would loan one of the cows to somebody while theirs were uh, dry. And uh, everybody helped everybody. Uh, and you, you uh, my dad would not have, if you had said, Mr. Coleman, uh, what is it? Is a, um, well, what am I supposed to say? Planner. Budget. Yeah. Uh, budget. Oh. My, my dad didn't know what a budget was. Yeah. But but in the fall of the year, he made sure he had so many bushels of corn in the crib. He made sure there's so many bushels of wheat up over the smokehouse. He made sure there's three hogs in the salt box in the smokehouse. He made sure there's 26 loads of stove wood in the woodshed. He made sure in the fall of the year, he made sure that he was could go through the winter without bothering anything or anybody. Wow. But he didn't know what a budget was. But he knew how but, to run, uh, run, run his yeah, home, didn't he? The, the, the thing, uh, my dad was, well, people, somebody say something about Mr. George and they said, well, if he said it, you can take it to the bank. Right. Because if he said it, and, and uh, people knew what he, he meant. We had uh, one guy, bad guy to drink. We had two kids, two girls, and somebody, uh, they'd go up to a little, had a little country store up here, Mr. and Ms. King, and uh, Miss Tommy was old and whatnot, and those girls would go up there after school and help her or what not and the other. And old man King got to messing with one of them one time. And my dad found out about it. And uh, he just went over to the man's house and called him out and started to talk to him. The guy said something. He said, well, wait a minute. I know what I come over here for. You, you just listen to what I'm telling you. He said, I know what's been going on. But he said, let me tell you something. If it happens again, you will answer to me. Do you understand me? And that man said, yes, sir. He never bothered those girls yeah. again. Because if dad told him something, you could depend yeah. on it. Yeah. And uh, funny things, they were in front of the big house over there, there was 10 acres. And if you planted in cotton, it, take, it took 13 rows. If you planted in corn, it took 11 rows. I mean, things like that. Yes. And uh, this big field down here was all, we farmed it all. In, the pastor came back in the woods and back over there and whatnot. Um, it, it, uh, 
people that had to live like that today would be crying and pissing and moaning and griping and whatnot, but everybody yeah. took care of everybody. Uh, nobody it, it wasn't hungry. Yeah. Now, the supper, the evening meal, you call it, it was always, it wasn't nothing in the world but uh, sweet milk and cornbread. Cause we kept the uh, milk down in the spring box about oh half a mile from my house and milk and put it down and go get the milk and come back have cornbread and milk for supper. That was good eating too. But other things that people shun on this day and time, if you got up in the morning we'd have biscuit and syrup and butter and if you poured out too much syrup in your plate, dad would look at it and say, put that in the safe, you'll eat it next meal. You didn't leave nothing on the plate. You put it in the safe and eat the next meal. I mean, it was... So there was no waste. No, you didn't have no waste. I mean, there wasn't no room for waste. But every Saturday, Saturday morning, Dad would get up and we'd go to the creek, or if it happened to be raining, we'd get out under the house feet and take a bath. And then Saturday afternoon, you'd go, <coughs> you'd go to Ross on Saturday afternoon. That was a must. Yeah. You go down that mule wagon, have mules and horses tied all over them woods down there. Um, this, uh, and then occasionally now, Dad would go uh, once a week. He'd go to Atlanta for the mercantile store there, and he'd leave on Monday and go down and pick up a load of merchandise and come back to Pole Town and spend the night and come back to Roswell the next day. And the bridge, oh, the bridge over the river was an old wooden bridge. And most of the mules and horses, you'd have to stop and blindfold them before you'd go across the bridge. They wouldn't, it was a covered bridge. And most of them wouldn't even go in there without, you had to blindfold them to get them across the river. Is that where the bridge is now on Roswell yeah. Road that goes across? Yeah, where the yeah. old one is down there on Roswell yeah. Road. That was a covered bridge. And there was a hotel right down. Uh, you see the pictures, and you, there was a hotel right down there on this side of the bridge. And the old uh, the train came when they built Morgan Fall or Bush Loose. They uh, ran a railroad, had to have a railroad to ship all of that stuff in there to build that dam. So they built a railroad from Chamley down to Bush Loose. And then, uh, so they got that close, so they built a spur came up beside the river, to just on the other side of the river. Huh. Uh, Big Mac a train came up to right there. How long was that train in operation? Mm -hmm. Well, it took them about several years to build that dam. And then the train came on for several years after the dam was finished. Oh, yeah. um, but... Uh, when you went to school in Roswell, I, I saw... Well, I started school at Hardscrabble. Right up here at the corner of King and uh, Woodstock Road, mm -hmm. and a little it was a three room schoolhouse up there, and uh, the old pipe bedded stove in the middle of the room for heat, and a bucket and a dipper in the corner. Mm -hmm. Everybody drank out of the same bucket with the same dipper, <laughs> and each family in the winter time, it'd be this family would. That's a week to furnish wood for the stove. Next week was another family furnish wood for the stove. Uh, and it, it was, and then the partitions were just, this side would have boards on it, but that side was just the two before. Huh. And uh, <laughs> crazy things. We had one old gal named Lena May, I won't call her last name. She was redheaded and crazy. And it was a knot hole between the two classes. She stuck her tongue through that knot hole one day. One of the boys, probably one of my brothers, <laughs> grabbed her tongue and she was a screaming and was hollering. <laughs> and little uh, things, you say, well, I don't tell things like this, but in the wintertime, big old pot belly stove in front. And Sue Bagel lived right out here. She was a teacher in that room. And a little girl back in the back held up her head to go to the bathroom. And Sue looked at the watch. She says, only 10 minutes till break. 
you can't go. And this was in the winter time. Well, she went back and sat down in a minute. She well, I she just could, she couldn't wait that ten minutes. She ago. farted. You could have heard her from here oh. down to that house, and then this water went everywhere. Oh. So what did Susie? She had her stand up at the heater and dry out. Oh God! Ah. <laughs> hey, well. And you, things you had to punish them, you'd make you sit on imagination. You ever sit on imagination? No. You know what that Not is? that I know of. Well, you, you back up to that wall just like you're sitting in a chair. Oh, it's squat down. No, you wouldn't squat. Your legs had to be straight out, yeah. and you back up against the wall. Yeah. And you say, go over and sit on imaginary. <laughs> well, you're talking about yeah. getting your legs tired. Yeah. And, and they, uh, punishment is just teacher sends you down in the woods to cut a switch to come back and whip you with. Yeah. If you come back with one broke up, they'd send somebody else after that switch. And the uh, bathroom was a two buildings down in the woods. And, the ladies was what they call a three holder, the men the two holder, yeah. and the latch on the door was a this, this close the door like this, and you see this old yeah. hook through there, and, yeah. hold it up. and the guys would go around, and some of the girls would go to the bathroom, somebody sneak down there and jerk a string <laughs> out where they couldn't get out of the bathroom. <laughs> all kind of devil, and then the teachers at Hill going up to school in the winter time. Rain and they drove no uh, a mile forward. The deltas and a lot of times they'd get stuck on that hill and they'd holler and the three or four of the bigger boys would go down there and they'd push them, get them nearly to the top, and then they turn and pull them back down to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, it was well, it good. sounds like you had plenty of fun. Oh yeah, have a fight and fight. Uh, as me and one old boy called him Dabo Kent, and after we started the Northwestern, he and I'd go out every day at lunch and we'd put on a show. We'd make out like we was mad and fight. And one day we was out there playing around and he took a swing at me and I ducked at the wrong time, hit me right in that eye and I carried a black eye for weeks. <laughs> well, at some point the, the depression was at its peak. Did you feel that a lot here based on what y'all were doing and your... Right now, you're right. The depression, you know, in the 30s? Uh, you know, uh, the main thing people did during the depression, uh, everybody made sure everybody else had something to eat. Mm -hmm. We didn't, you know, like nowadays, uh, pardon my language, we yeah. didn't piss and moan and go on yeah. about it. Yeah. We just took life like it was. But like I said, my dad didn't know what a budget was, but in the spring, in the fall year, he had 26 loads of stove wood in him. He had meat and everything. He knew he, we were going to eat for the entire winter. And then on uh, his off time, he'd always go to Atlanta, I mean to Roswell, and he worked for uh, the mercantile store up there. Once a week, he'd go to, to Buck at the Atlanta and pick up some. Well, he must have been a hard-working man. He was a hard-working man, and uh, the good thing about him, you hear anything about people talking, and somebody say, well, if Mr. George said it, yeah. you can take it to the bank. And it was, he, he was very, he wasn't, didn't beat us, but he was strict. Yeah. We had to abide by the rules. Yeah. Um, and my mother died when I was 22 months old. I never never knew my mother uh, and uh, but it uh, it was a hard life but <clears throat> I think we were a lot happier then than young folks are now yeah. it sounds like it sounds you like know, you we, had a great community and you know where you go we'd have it in fall year we'd have a peanut picking and all pick off peanuts uh, yeah. we'd have this that and the other and it was always pulling a prank we'd get a new one in the crowd and have a party at night, and, and then they pick off peanuts, and we'd say, okay, we're gonna go snipe hunting. And we'd take this new guy or girl back down in the woods and go up a long ditch to the head of that ditch, and give them a, I mean, a burlap sack, and say, now, 
you going to stay here and hold this sack. We're going to run that snipe up this ditch and we'd leave him there and we'd go back to the house. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Heard a lot of stories about snipe hunting. <laughs> That's a good one there. <laughs> about it. And, uh, uh, wasn't much problems with, uh, nowadays the young people that I, I know, uh, our strict rulers, we had the Darnell family that lived over next door to us, and they had a boy and a girl, a son, Emory, and the sister was about 12 or 13 years old. And back in them days, the girls were, you know, skirt down long, below long their knees. Here. And we was out there playing one day, aggravating. I mean, she kept coming out and wanting to play and aggravating us. And, uh, I don't know which one was one or the other of us. She was started by and just flipped her skirt like that. She went and told her mother about it. And then they come out and beat the shit out of both of them. Really? Yes, wow. Marie. You didn't flip a girl's dress up above her knee. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's move to the, say, the late 30s now. And you were in your teens. Did, did you have any idea what was going on over in Europe with the between well, Europe with the Germans and with the Japanese and, and the Well, you farms. see, when radios first came out, uh, I worked on weekends. My brother had a service station, and i go on weekends and work for him for a dollar or two each weekend. And they come out with radios, they had to have a battery with them. And I saved up my money and bought a radio and a car battery. And on Sunday night, everybody would come to the house to hear the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, it was just a different, different, different world. Finally, the Brennans came into Roswell with a movie, but it was a silent movie. Mm -hmm. Up over the old Roswell store, now it's still there, and they go up in there and they had to, and Tom Upshur from Alpharetta had two boys. And Tom talked gruff and steep, but he'd go in and put the caption on there. Well, he'd read it, and he'd read it so loud you'd hear it all over the building. Nobody else needed to read it. But then they finally got to talking movies. Yeah. And, but, uh, see, Roswell had the, old, the Roswell store, which was a store for the mill down there. And uh, in that store was... I never saw one like it before or since, but they had a, over in the corner, a little built up a little bit and kind of a little cage over there. And two ladies was in there. And in all about four or five places in the store, there was a cable come through there. And you go buy something and the girl reached up there and pull a little old cup about that big and either put your charge ticket or the money in there. And she'd pull this thing and throw it over to that little office. And they'd do whatever they do and put it back up. They'd pull it, throw it back to that. Good gosh. You always go far from here to out past my garage across the whole building. And that's the way the money came back. Wow. Nobody hardly ever paid for anything. You charged it. Mm. You just charged it to dad. Uh, I know uh, in the fall year, before school start, dad go down to the Royal store and he'd buy me a new pair of shoes. New pair of overalls, a new shirt. That was my school clothes for the year. All year. Huh? But all three of them didn't cost four dollars. Golly. And, and when you went to school, if you come home from school, you come in the house, you went in and you know, changed clothes before you went to the safe to get something to eat. And you'd lay those clothes out on the bed and you wore that same pair of shirt and overalls all the week, and then was sad is my sisters would wash it, and we'd wear that most of the time. That was all the whole year, the same clothes. So you really had to take care of your clothes, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, if you got a hole in your bottom of your shoes, you'd put pasteboard in it. Yeah. Couldn't afford to have them have so. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about Pearl Harbor being bombed. Do you remember? that day and how you found out about it and what your feelings were and what happened with the people around you when they heard it? Well, really it was the shock. 
I think everybody was more or less in shock. Now, see, I was only uh, 18, 17, 18 years old. No, I wasn't that old. I was only 16 years old, I guess. Anyway, uh, I know uh, two of my cousins in Roswell uh, were going to volunteer for the Army, and uh, I was You were probably about 18. No, I was 15 or 16. I know they said, well, we're going to join the Army. I said, I'm going with you. Oh. And uh, they said, well, you can't get in. You ain't old enough. I said, well, I'll lie about it. And Dad found out about it, and he put, he gave me a discharge. <laughs> <laughs> and this was before Pearl Harbor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then 40, 41. And, uh, when you joined the serve, talk about your decision to go into the military. Did you were you drafted? Did you volunteer? No, I volunteered. Okay. Uh, I volunteered to go in the Marine Corps, okay. and uh, I went in on December the eighth of nineteen forty three. Yeah, December. But anyway, I, I, I stayed in exactly three years. I, December the 8th of 43, and got my discharge December the 8th of 45. Oh, okay. well, let's I, talk about your military career. Just talk about your experiences, where you went to train, and then going overseas, and what happened overseas. and Just talk, talk about your well, three years in the Marines. The Marine Corps, you went to Paris Island, or you easily camp was June, but I went to Paris Island, and uh, that was all sand, you know, wooden barracks back in those days. Uh, but uh, you'd have some little old PFC about as big as a minute, mean as a dang dog. But they, they see the thing, they, their job, people can't understand this, that DI's job was to take Mama's little baby and had 10 weeks to make him so damn mean he'd kill anything. I mean, that was his job. He was he had to make you mean. He didn't want no intention of making you because he had Mama's babies and Mama's and little oddballs and everything. And rough, it was rough. But in 10 weeks, you were a Marine because they worked your butt off. And the discipline, I know in the middle of the barracks, you had the gun racks, <clears throat> stack your rifles in there. And I remember one night somebody did something, something about the rifles, I don't know what it was. And the old DI called him and he, and he said, Private, yes sir, get all those guns off of that, that rack over there and lay them across your bunk. Yes sir, he did. He said, now you sleep on that tonight. <laughs> he slept on those rifles that night. Wasn't no easy stuff, everything. Oh, wow. They were rough and mean, but see, they had 10 weeks to take from mama's little yeah. baby to the odd ones to the other. 10 weeks to make them meaner than the devil. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was rough and mean, but, but 10 weeks you come out of there tough. And... Quite a few didn't, couldn't even get through boot camp. Yeah. Um, now, where did you go after that? Well, I left uh, PI and went to uh, a guard battalion in uh, Washington, D.C., or in Maryland. And uh, we were guarding the, the uh, Naval Communications Center there in, in, uh, in the edge of Maryland. And they had, uh, like, our back was right here, and down there where that second house is was a big building that had 3,000 waves in it, Ooh. nurses, yeah. and uh, there was plenty of women. And I met the nicest gal there named Ann Pearson from Des Moines, Iowa, and I dated her all the time I was there. But I can see her... <laughs> I got in the galley, and I mean, I've always been a cook. 
So they found out I could cook, and I got in the galley for mess duty, and I asked the old sergeant, I said, hey, we don't ever have any dessert. He said, what do you mean? I said, we don't, I said, how about me making some pies or something? We can you? I said, you're darn tootin'. <laughs> so I started making pies and cakes, and I was, I was a hero. <laughs> but I remember uh, I was out in front of the barracks, and she came walking there like that, like that, and up on that top tier, and she came walking and across up and hey, honey, look what we got. She was mailing her subsistence check. <laughs> and we, she was, she was a nice lady, and we were friends for oh, three or four months, and then I got transferred out. I wound up, I got a, I had a wart right there and a wart right there, and I was in the kitchen, and they, and they come in there that somebody did and said, you ain't got no business working in the kitchen with them warts on your hand. Go out to, to the uh, Naval Communications Center and let them take them out. So I went out there, and they got infected, and they kept me for I don't know how long, and I'd go home on Friday, go to the barracks on Friday, and the skipper had asked me something about this, sir. And, uh, about the third week, I got aggravated at I, I said, sir, I am a private. I, I have to do what I'm told. The doctors are telling me what to do, so therefore, I don't have any control over it. Well, pissed him off. <laughs> so when I come back, he transferred my butt out. <laughs> I went to uh, Port Rhode Island and trained there and then went overseas. But, that, uh, excuse me. I always, uh, any time, even on the ship, we got on that ship in Quonset Port, Rhode Island, old converted cattle ship, five decks deep, and I never, oh Lord. That, that, you, I slept down there two nights and I come out of there because a lot of it get seasick, yeah. five deck high, and this guy puking to come down on everybody else. Yeah. So I come out of there and I went to the kitchen and I asked somebody, who's the head knocker here? The guy right over there. And I went around and says, I need a job in the kitchen. He said, I don't like how everybody in this chicken is full. I, I said, man, I need a job in the kitchen. He said, I've got a, everybody I need. And I looked over there and there were two big old 15 gallon coffee urns. And uh, I looked at him like that. He looked at me and he realized I was serious. He said, I'll tell you what I do, Private. He says, you see them two big old coffee urns over there? I said, yes, sir. He says, at 9 o'clock, they're to be stripped down, clean as a pen. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, they're to be full of hot coffee. You understand that now? I said, yes, sir. He says, can you do it? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> he said, well, start right now. So well, that's what I did. And then I never did go back in the hole. I brought my... Uh, blanket roll up there and put it on a stainless steel table and I slept on that stainless steel table. And to eat, I'd get to go to the bakery and get a, take a pound of, I mean, take a gallon pitcher of hot coffee, swap it to him for a loaf of bread, go get one, go to the supply room, swap it to that guy for a pound of butter. And I lived on bread and butter most of the day. Because I can look right now and I can see that Big old pot of boiled potatoes sitting on the end of that table. Old boiled ice potato. <clears throat> but I always managed to eat pretty good because, see, once I got good with the, both the supply room and and the bread man, I ate bread and butter. And, and I, I always managed to make out. I mean, I've been a. Um, well, do you have any meat? To speak of meat, like chicken. Oh yeah, you'd have well, eat pretty good. Yeah. Now, yeah, most of your meat was canned, like canned beef and stuff yeah. like that. But I've always, uh, I guess you'd call me a gang leader. Uh, and in the tent where I stayed, most people talk about Sergeant So and So's tent. That my tent. They didn't say it's Sergeant Com, uh, whatever his name was. That's Coleman's tent. Because <laughs> I, uh, on uh, 
Toronto. <coughs> where did you go first after you got off the ship? Where, where were you? Well, I went straight from Quonset, Rhode, Rhode Island, straight across to Toronto. Toronto, okay. Yeah. And could you tell us what unit you were in with? I went in and service in 43 and come out in 45. Okay. And, and I was the second wave in on Toronto. Okay. And was that the 2nd Marine Division or what? Well, that, we were B Battery, the 2nd Marine Division. Okay. okay. And our gun was a 155 long time. Yeah, we're, we're going to have you show that gun and talk about it in a few minutes. Talk about your first impression when you saw Tararua and you got off the ship. Talk about what you did and what your experiences were. Because that was a pretty hot area from what I've known. Well, what, what, what you do in the Marine Corps, you just do what you're told and ask no questions. But um, me, I'm always the agitator, the instigator, or the ringleader. Uh, but it didn't make any difference where we was. If anybody else eat, my tent eat. I sent two men out every night on a procuring party. What do you mean? I said, two men from my tent, you'd go out and steal it. If you stole something that we couldn't use, you had to take it back the next night and put it where it was. <laughs> I know one day they uh, came in and inspected the tent, and I can't sleep on one of those little bunks, so I built me a platform in the corner and I got enough wood and built it to flat platform and under it was that space so I had me a curtain around it. and the old captain was in there one morning in his and he pushed that curtain back and then he did I said hey we eat pretty good in here don't we captain because <laughs> there was two cases of a fruit cocktail and a case of peaches under that <laughs> Sack that we had stole, <laughs> and then I had a uh, got a hold of a five gallon milk jug and got old Boston Blackie to give me um, a five gallon of sugar and five gallon of raisin, and I'd make raisin jack. God. Get that and work it off this ride. You get it about eighty proof or so. <laughs> but I had an inspection one day, and I had that five gallon milk or ten gallon milk jug sitting there. And the, Little old inspector says, "What is that?" I says, "That's Jack, sir." Jack, I suggested, yes, "That's Jack." I said, I, "I make it all the time. The men like it and need it." He says, "Pour it out." And that's the only time I ever begged an officer in my life. But I says, "Sir, that Jack is just nearly ready to come off, and we need it. Don't make me pour it out. Pour it out." I says, "Sir, please, please let the boys have it." He made me pour it out. I hated his guts from then on because there wasn't no reason to make me pour that out because yeah. he was just about ready to drink. Mm. <laughs> but we, uh, like I say, every night I'd have a procuring party go out, two men, and steal. Well, you had to be one of the most popular soldiers on the island. Well, I wasn't popular, but everybody, uh, you know, is always a ringleader. Well, at that time, I was six feet tall, weighed right close to 200 pounds, old farm boy, hard as a darn rock. And nobody messed with me because they knew I was strong as an ox. Yeah. So I was always, and I always liked to be the ring leader. Yeah. But uh, I know we, the, the time I got in trouble the, on Tarawa, the uh, Air Force and the Navy was getting beer and we wasn't getting any. And uh, Wayne Lee Hopping come open the flat of my tent, <coughs> and we knew the shipment. We knew a load of beer had come in to the warehouse. And he opened the door and he said, "The door to the warehouse is down." And I turned around to my boy and I said, "I'll be back in 15 minutes with the truck. We'll go." And I went over to the motor pool, climbed under the back of the fence. First guy checked out a six for six. I tailgated him right out. Got over and we backed up to that warehouse. And I said, start throwing it on when I holler, we go. So I backed up and there's a little, I looked down the beach and I saw two lights coming. Well, the road was along the beach and he, he didn't get off the road on that island because of the sand. So I hollered, let's go, boy. So I got in there and I went, 
then turned the light on. I just headed right straight toward him. And I got about as close from here to the fence out there to him. Pulled the light. He went in the sand. And we went on and unloaded that beer. <laughs> and they, we buried it under the flap of the tent. We got caught for that. Got court martial. But. Uh, what did they do? As a well, it wasn't nothing they could do, but took my rank and and give us uh, when they went to trial. I never will. <laughs> trial was crazy. <laughs> the old captain, I mean, lieutenant was my judge and whatnot. And uh, there's a. Uh, you don't listen to me. <laughs> Uh, questioning me about this, that, and the other. Sergeant in the tent, I, we, we, we was protecting him, and they kept questioning her. And, and I said, well, Sergeant was asleep. And the old first lieutenant, judge, or whoever was, kept, he kept pushing me and asking me why I didn't, why, 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 why. I said, sir, I didn't go around and pull her out and around his butt to wake him up. I just thought he was asleep. <laughs> I wonder they had put me in jail. Because <laughs> I, I, never, I didn't ever take no crap off of none of them. <laughs> well, I bet your man loved you as a leader. Oh, yeah. We just, it, it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't a tent number so on. That's Coleman's tent. <laughs> Let's talk about what's. Ask about the landing at Tarawa. When they landed at Tarawa. Yeah, talk about when you first landed at Tarawa. This experience that. Well, that's an experience you don't want to go through. Because uh, most of us were green. Uh, we went in there and they supposedly had gone back in history and knew all about coal. Well, what they didn't take in the fact that it called road. So according to the old theory, the um, LSTs, LCTs, that we were going to put a little boat about, about as wide as this room and about 50 feet long and flat bottom with a ramp that just dropped down. And they loaded us off of the ship and into that. And we headed in, they're supposed to be able to go up to the beach. Well, they took off in there and then bottomed out in water about that deep. Well, they just let the ramp down and go. So we waded ashore. And I never will forget that. I'd always been told that Japanese were little people. And I waded ashore and got there and I looked up there and there's a coconut tree right on the beach. And there was a dead man laying up there. He'd been shot and he stopped and he's Died leaned up against that tree. But he, he was about six feet tall uh. and uh, weighed about 200 pounds. And I looked at him and I said, Son, something I done lied to you. I said, We've always been told that Japs are little people, and that son of a gun ain't no little guy. Yeah. But then we waited on in and got set up and everything. And, uh, we lost, uh, what was it? 800 and something guys on the invasion of Toronto. Let's talk about that. Uh, just the action you saw and just what you experienced in the combat. Well, they were they were dug in. And when I say dug in, you'd find a place where a Nips, he'd have a hole about, four, about three feet, two or three feet square, about four feet deep in the ground. And then in the walls, he'd have little places he'd dug out and then took um, bamboo and made little shells and he lived in that hole underground and uh, there were about 5,000 of them on that island uh, and then they had that one big 12-inch uh, gun that they'd moved from Guadalcanal up there but anyway uh, we all had to wade the shore and uh, you know they didn't know stuff now like they know but if they went on the other side of the island, we could have run up on the beach with them, but they, uh -huh. they was to go in this way. Anyway, yeah. we went in. It took us two days to secure the island. Were you under fire as you 
went oh, on the yeah. beach. Oh, yeah, she was under fire all the time. Um, and they had gone around there and took coconut palms and there's a wall about, about four feet high of coconut palms made a wall and made it hard for our vehicles to get over and whatnot until mm -hmm. the bulldozers got in. And, you know, even the tanks would go up and stall on that. And uh, we lost quite a few men. In fact, uh, 900, 800 and something men we lost going into the trial. But once we got it secured, uh, every night at 10 o'clock, just you could set your watch by it. They sent either four or eight or 12 planes over to Bombs Island. And then about six or seven weeks of that, they never hit the island but one time. It was so small. Yeah. They, that is, it was only a mile and a half long and a half mile wide. Yeah. We were up there and trying to hit it with a bomb. And I remember at night here, Sirens go off, and you can hear them coming, and you hear it, oh, flutter, 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 boom, flutter, flutter. And that, the only one that hit the island that one night, I was, I never did, I never went in a foxhole, I mean, in a pit yeah. where they had to, you know, dig out and right. put where a whole battalion and get underground. Uh uh, not this boy. I ain't, I ain't gonna die underground. Yeah. So when they have a raid or anything, I just find myself. And I was out on a company street there, and I heard them were coming, and I thought, that, that, that's pretty close. And the next one, I said, ooh. And I was right out in the middle of the company street, and I fell around there, and I could feel where a bulldozer turned around, there's a little ridge of dirt about that high. And I just stretched out right in that, because I knew that was, and it hit, I was close from here down to that second house, hit that airplane, it blew up. Big piece of metal went over my head, just red hot. And I, I know I was, my whole body was below that two inch. <laughs> I was flat. Yeah. But that is the only time they ever hit the island. Uh, Talk about your responsibilities. What, uh, what were you doing? Uh, what was your mission? Well, see, they put me on that 155. Started off on the long term, and uh, I don't know how I always uh, got to be the ramrod or whatnot. But uh, my sergeant in charge of my gun, uh, I, well, it sounds like I'm bragging, but they always picked somebody that was what they call zero tolerance dependable. Whatever you told them, they'd do it. Mm -hmm. So the gunner put me on the, as a linyard man. That was the man that pulled the trigger. Okay. And uh, so all I had to do was uh, that gun that had a big old breech about that big and, and a handle on it and you close it and you just jig and the little fingers went out and locked it or you couldn't the back front. And my job was to, to handle, open it up and let them swab it and give you all clear, and then they'd put, take six men and put a, like a uh, gurney in, four men, and they'd put that shell on there and, or and take a ram and ram it in there. And then the guy would come back with either one or two bags of powder and put them in there. And then when they'd do that, then the, uh, I'd reach and get that lever, close that thing and lock it down and threw my bullet, screw the little thing in there for the bullet, and holler, loaded and locked. And then I'd stand there and wait till when he said fire to jerk that stick and shoot. So I was nothing to the job. Let's do two things. We've got a picture here of the type of gun that you were involved with, and also talk about the impact on you and your body when that gun would fire. Well, see, you dig in and build up about four or five feet all the way around with sandbags. And that gun was sitting right in the middle of that. Well, when you fired, the, the suction of air from behind that bullet and that powder going out, it just, and it pulled sand out of them sandbags 
and it almost go through your leg, through your britches, and just sting the heck out of the back of your leg where that percussion had pulled that sand back. And then you load another one. Yeah, show the picture and point to the gun. And well, you see this, this was the gun right here. It was, this is a little different from one we had. Turn it a little bit to the front, so there we go. And say again what type of gun? What that was, was a 155 long time. Okay. They had to, and then we later on got the 155 Houser. This was a, a long barrel that shot, you shoot straight from here to the target. Yeah. And when it came back and got the 155 Houser, it was where you could lob a shell over a mountain. This, this gun, you could only shoot straight. Yeah. When we got the house, it was this same gun, except it didn't have that long barrel, and you could shoot it, lob it, and lob it over a mountain. So it was. I assume, based on the size of the island and the number of Japanese that were there, you were in pretty close contact with the enemy as an individual. Well, uh, islands a mile and a half long, half a mile wide. And they had 5,000 Imperial Marines on yeah. So you know how close yeah. it was. And, uh, but they were, uh, they dug in individually. Most of them did. They were in a little place about that big square, down about four feet deep. And he lived in that hole. Mm -hmm. We lived in barracks, you know, whatnot, but they lived individually. And, um, Um, it, it was, I don't know, they trained different from what we was. They, were, they either kill you or you're going to kill them. That's what it was. Wasn't no in between. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. And, uh, go, well, go we, didn't, we didn't take any prisoners. They didn't take any prisoners. Uh, the order came out for there on the end of it that wanted them to get a capture a Japanese officer where we could question him. And some of them found one and put him in the, on the LST, L60, took him to the ship. They put him in the net and raised him up and let him down. And when they let the net down, the sailors cut him into shreds so they could even question him and let him live. And when he hit the deck, they cut him up. I mean, and we had the old saying then, uh, uh, Alan or, Ed Roosevelt hates Alan or, and Alan or hates war. Yeah, yeah. Or the other way around. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, it's, you're a different person in combat than you are in life. I mean, uh, out here you always figure out how we can get by, do this and do that. Uh, in there, I'm going to survive. Yeah. Yeah. So we lost uh, 800 and something men on Tarara, uh, and they lost over 4,000. Well, oh, they had 5,000 Imperial Marines yeah. plus a su support group. Were you con continually moving your gun and your crew up, or did you no, move stationary? Uh, well, you didn't. On the trial, was only a mile and a half yeah. long, a half mile wide. And it had a range where you didn't need to do that, I guess. Oh, well, when you used to move in because you couldn't get any closer. Yeah. See, we had three batteries set up on the, on the big end, which is the widest part. Four guns in the battery. And... Uh, how long every, did it take? Oh, excuse me. You go ahead. Every night at 10 o'clock, oh, they sent either four or eight planes over bombing, trying to bomb the island. And they hit it one time in yeah. a month. How long did it take for you to eventually take the island? Approximately? Uh, two days. Two days. Yeah. We secured the island on such a day. Did you ever experience some of the Japanese suicide charges that you? Read about Bonsai. Him. Bonsai. No, well, we did have one on Guam after we came back, but that was a, you know, it's just a, uh, Guam. 
and people look, can't understand Guam today, but Guam is a is a big island of tunnels and mountains. Three or four years after the war was over, they had Japanese come out of that mountains, surrendered. They didn't even know the war was over. They'd been living in those caves. You go back in there on patrol and you look and you can see a little pile of ashes and you knew that there'd been some Japs with a dog. Every one of them had dogs. And those dogs were their guard. And as that dog would hear you and bark, they'd hit the hill. Huh. But uh, you'd go in those caves and the cold would still be warm. Wow. Now after Tarawa, did you, where did you go that, then? Well, I left the rod and came back to uh, Did you go to another island or back to the country? I US? came back to Hawaii. Oh, okay. Now was the war over by then? No. Uh, okay. And I came and I left the I left Hawaii and went then from there to uh, the Philippines. Oh. But now I was uh, I was in ordinance. Uh, my record says I was in the Philippines, but I never was in the Philippines. Because uh, you leave your ordinance uh, within range, but out of danger of the battle. And uh, So what was your responsibility when you were in the Philippines? I was in the ordinance, keep, all, keep the big guns going. Oh, okay. We'll just continue on with what happened during the rest of the war from my well, personal it, experience. You know, they, 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 on the Philippines there, they had, they had captured a bunch of our people and were holding them on the Philippines. And they, uh, I don't know where it was, the CBE battalion or one of the certain battalion, might have been our, but anyway, they. Uh, came in on the south end of the Philippines and that prison was up on the other end and it was the, uh, in an area where they all they had to do was just fence like from here to the, that second house down there and the rest was back into the jungle and it was so thick he couldn't move. So I don't know if CBE's Army Marine Corps or something, anyway there's a bunch of them Somebody said, well, we're going to get those guys out of that prison. So they worked up from the lower end of the aisle and just cleared, just kept clearing until they got where they could get the trucks. And they kept coming a little bit, and then they got the trucks within, like from here down yonder to the road. And they was keeping in touch with the prisoners some way or another. But the prison was just, the front of it had the fence, and in the back was the jungle. So they drugged to find them until they got like within here to the, down to the road within walking distance. And they give a signal. And all the prisoners that was in there just walked into the jungle. And they met them and walked them down to the bus and whatnot. Took the prisoners. The guards woke up the next morning and didn't have no prisoners. <laughs> they just eased them out and got them on trucks and took them out. I think there was a movie made about that yeah. one. That was, a lot of work to get those guys. Mm -hmm. The ones that were sick and wounded, they carried them out on their back. Wow. Uh, but uh, I never was in any real big danger except, well, they bombed Tarawa pretty big. And uh, Yeah, I would say in Tarawa you were in big danger. Yeah, well, LST. They carried us up in an old LST, a flat bottom boat, about 50 feet wide, 300 feet long, flat bottom. And you can imagine how that thing <laughs> going over. <laughs> it goes away, that hole just rattled all through it. Where were you when the bombs were dropped on Japan, the atomic bombs? Mm, let's see, I got back to. Uh, And really, of more importance than that, what was? You, how did you find out? And what was your feeling when you heard that the bombs, the first one, then the second one, had been been dropped? 
I don't even remember. And I, we might not have known about it for two or three days. Because yeah. communication then is not like it is yeah. today. I, that movie, Private Ryan, yeah. wherever where they went, they walked. You walk everywhere you went in the wars, even in World War II, you didn't walk. You had a jeep or a, yeah. some kind of a, something, a tank or something to ride on. <laughs> but I thought, Lord help a guy that did that movie dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and they they didn't they didn't ever use the telephone. Well, we, even in the early war, you had field phones. You could call from here to Ross on each other, but they didn't use them in that movie. I didn't ever go see it. I just saw parts of it, and I said, "That's so stupid. I don't even want to watch it." <laughs> when when the Japanese surrendered. Where did you go from there when the war was over? You were still in the military. Yeah. Still in the Marines. Uh, let's see, when the war was over. Oh, I'd been, uh, we had come back to Hawaii yeah. to, tr to regroup. And I was in Hawaii when the war was over. Okay. And did you, did you get released Shortly thereafter, I believe it. Uh, took about a month for us to get, you know, you can't just close everything down right. yeah. like you do in civilian life. Because yeah. there's so many of them had to yeah. be, everybody had to be on that. And it so happened that I, I went in on, uh, and I stayed exactly to the day, three years. December the eighth, the December the eighth. Huh. That was strange. I look, I was looking at that one day, and I thought, "That's odd." <laughs> I went in on December the eighth, forty-three. Come out December the eighth, forty-five. Talk about your emotions when you first saw the United States again after the war. When you got back, did you come into the West Coast, San Francisco? Yeah, I came in on the West Coast. Came in and they loaded us on six by sixes and. Headed up to San Diego, and, and uh, everybody on the road was just hollering and waving at us, and we're uh, getting up real close and handing a bottle of whiskey out <laughs> to somebody. Uh, just, that must have made you feel pretty good that people appreciated what you oh, did. Oh yeah. We, well, you used to be back on the U.S. Oil. Yeah. You used to tickle to death. But I knew we were getting out there. We had an old buddy of mine who had kinfolk up in Los Angeles. And he, we got a 72. We were going to go up and visit him. And we were going to thumb a ride. We got out there on that six-lane highway, you know, <laughs> going to thumb a ride. <laughs> I thought, and the minute I looked down, I was as far as from here to the back door back there out in the field. Cause those cars going out, I'd step back and step, step back and step. The old boy, I'd wait and say, come on back out, we're on the road, stupid. <laughs> and we caught, a, <laughs> we caught a ride with an old lady in a 42 Buick stick shift, had her grandson with her. And we piled up in the back seat of that and took off up the road. And we were going to Los Angeles, but she hit that super highway at, 90 miles an hour and didn't have no brakes on that darn thing. And we got up, we hadn't been in there, we didn't go 50 miles. So I pointed to my buddy and I said, he got it looking. And uh, we didn't have you know, I told him, I said, we, I, we, our exit is this next one. <laughs> she said, yes sir, and she pulled off. We got out. I, <laughs> wasn't a sign of a break on that darn old Buick. They're doing 70 and 80 miles an hour. <laughs> Woo! That's a lot safer in the war. <laughs> Had her grandson with her. <laughs> well, when you got back to Roswell, you were, you were out of the Marines now, right? Talk a little bit about the rest of your life and uh, family and 
what, what you did after you got out of the service, what kind of adjustment it was to all of a sudden go from being in war to being a civilian? To me, there was no adjustment to it. I mean, I've always, my theory is always, hey, take what you got today and do the best you can with it. That's yeah. what my dad yeah. always taught me. Yeah. So I came back and uh, started hunting a job. Yeah. Went back to work. Uh, and they were, I didn't, well, I got four inches and my head split, but that wasn't in combat. And was in putting up a BC tower and a guy on the top let a piece of inch and a half steel, you know, you take four feet and four feet and then up this way and make a, and then we'd take those and build a BC tower. And I was in the bottom and putting them on the rope and he was up to the top and he turned one loose and it come back and hit me in the back. And Top of the head, but old uh, Corman, red-headed Corman from Alabama, named Bliss. Uh, they drug me over to sick bay, and he co he he sewed my head up before the feeling ever come back. <laughs> when the feeling started coming up, I had about ten stitches, and they took me down X-ray at the hospital. The thing about that. Uh, there's not any of that in my record. Huh. Uh, the reason I found that out after I got back, I, uh, I did go to Lawson General for something. Anyway, they had me in the hospital over there. And oh, that is on my back, and where that thing hit me in the back, and they waited on to operate on my back. And I said, well, you, uh, they told me about it wasn't connected. I said, well, check my record. And they checked my record, there was no record of me ever going to the hospital in the South Pacific. Huh. And so I told them, I said, hey, ain't no quack Navy doctor gonna operate on me. I'm going home and let my doctor do it. <laughs> so I came home and they operated on my back. Uh -huh. What kind of work did you do for the rest of your career while you, after you got out of the service? Build houses, Trading business, okay. uh, chicken business, cattle business. Oh, yeah. A little bit of everything. You name it. Feed stores. Huh? Feed stores. Yeah, I had a feed store and a mill. And Spend a couple of minutes and tell us about your family. Your, you, I know you were married, you had children, you've got grandchildren. Or? Yeah, well... My family, I married a preacher's daughter from Gilmer County, my old tall slim. I had I was teaching uh, Sunday school at First Baptist Church of Rotterdam and had a young class and we had bring a friend party and I brought this tall slim blonde down there and to visit with us and after we'd eat I was like, she was old to sink, or I was one of us to sink washing dishes, and the other one started helping. And we washed dishes and we talked and we talked. And the next day I went up to the store where the guy worked that had brought her. And I said, Roger, that bond you brought last night, what's the deal? You ain't going to do no good with her. I said, let me tell you something. I said, that's my woman. He said, what? I said, that is my woman. I'm going to marry her. And he laughed at me, but I married her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said when you ever said something, you did it. So that, you sure did it that time. I had the best day of my life, and I got her. Her daddy was an old baby preacher out of Gilmer County. Her mother was crippled. Had a lady live with them called Snowy Carnes. They was in a car wreck and got all beat up. And that cousin came to help them out after that wreck and never did go home. Huh. Well, she did when she got old. Her brother came and got her and took her back home. But she lived with them, what, 20 years probably? Snowball.
I can see her out there in that yard now when Steve was little in that little stool about that high up there. And uh, he get, wanted her to get on that stool and jump off. And I can hear him out there, jump, bro, jump, bro. <laughs> Finally, Bo got up on that <laughs> and <they> jumped. <laughs> Oh, Lord. <laughs> Snowball was something else. How many children and grandchildren have you had? Me? Did I, did I uh, admit to? <laughs> yeah, the, just the ones you can talk about. Not yeah, the two, two young ones and five, ten. Six grandkids. Six, Six grandkids uh, and yeah. 20 great grandkids. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, she went all up to North Georgia to that college, and the only thing she got a, she didn't get an education. She got a husband. Well, that's more important. Yeah, got a pretty good one too. Good. Don't tell him I said. That. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Do either of y'all have any questions at all? I mean, this this has been a fact-filled experience. He would never talk about being in the military. Back when I was middle school age, that's when all the TV programs about the war were on, and I, and I thought it was very, you know, it was glamorous to me. It was like he yeah. was, and, and I would beg him to tell me, and he didn't ever talk about it. And then he went to his 50th reunion, and it's like they must have given each other permission to talk about it. You know? oh. He told my kids about being uh, getting busted, you know, okay. and I was like, but that's a great thing for you to tell my children. But it wasn't until... Um, it's probably been in, within the last 10 years that he told me about going into Tarawa and how the guys who were supposed to walk on were drowning on the way in. They're supposed to go in shooting while they were having to hold their weapons over their head and how it was just, they were just wiping them out. And I said, where were you? He said, I was standing on the ship waiting my turn to go in. And I said, Daddy, I mean, I was just squalling, you know, and I said, how in the world did you get off of that ship? And he said, it's my job. I never, never mm -hmm. thought. You know, he said, I said, what were you thinking? He said, it's my job. I just went running up right in after him, you know. And I was uh -huh. like, oh, my dad is awesome. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't mention it because you didn't mention it. I didn't know if you wanted to talk about it. But I, I know it was hard getting off those LSTs because guys would go down and they'd be under the water and some of them would, would drown. Well, you, you sometimes saw you wade that deep, but you didn't think nothing about it. You just battling to get to that Looking to see where you could find the first Jap to shoot at. Yeah. You, it, you don't. Well, really, you just don't think about what you're going to do. You just you you're told to do something, you do it. Mm -hmm. You don't think about what it is. Yeah. I mean, in the Marine Corps, uh, we were out there on the drill field one day, standing around, we been drilling. In, in P.I. in uh, this big dirt place where the marsh and the battalion was out there. And there's a guy come walking across about as far as me down yonder the road. And our D.I., those D.I. was a smart ex, always doing something. And we had a little old boy called Wayne Lee Hopping. He wasn't big as a minute. But we were standing there and the D.I. says, Hopping, front center! Hopping right away. Yes, sir. He said, you see that man going right down? Said, yes, sir. Go whip his ass. Yes, sir. He turned around and takes off. Just as hard as he could go, and he got about halfway, and he hollered at him. Hop in, hop. Come back. Come back. He said, do you know who that guy was, Hopping? No, sir. He said, that's Tommy Locker, world champion, boxing champion. <laughs> And he says, he told him who it was. What was you going to do? He says, I was going to whip his ass, sir. You told me to. <laughs> a good Marine. <laughs> you do what you told. <laughs> That's a good story. <laughs> and you know, in, in the Marine Corps, it's not different now, but back then, they told you to do something. You didn't ask no questions about it. You did it. One thing I want to do before we stop today is I want to want you to hold up this picture of 
a young, handsome Marine. Oh, Lord. Just a baby looking in there. Like that? Yeah, just like that. Yeah. Wow. Now, is the one over here after you'd been in a while? Mm. It looked like you look like you've grown up a lot since that first picture. Just look at that. Any idea where either one of them was made? Well, we mainly just wanted to get the pictures on the record so people who watch this can see see you in uniform. That's awesome. That's good. <laughs> That's good. I like the one in the middle the best. <laughs> yeah, that, very true. That's good. That's just where Katie numbered them when we took them down. That's the the blouse he still has in there in the closet. Wow. Yeah, that's me. I, that uniform there, a cousin of mine was in the Marine Corps and he wanted to borrow my uniform for something and he borrowed it and never did bring it back. I had yeah. to go buy a new one. <laughs> but I've got a, I've got one I wear now. In fact, I'll have it on whenever it is. Yeah. Memorial Day, I'll wear it. I like to, I'm a Marine. I like to strut. Well, you should. You should be proud of that. Yeah, I was, that blanket over there on that sofa, yeah, I was down at the big thing in Roswell about five years ago. And... Uh, I don't know who the guy was or nothing about it. I don't know how it come up, but somebody had one of those. And uh, I asked them about it. And they said, well, that's the only one they had. They cut it and the guy standing there listening to him, I reckon. But uh, about two or three weeks later, that guy brought me that one. Gosh. And I don't even know who he was. Before we close out, I want to give you a chance to say Anything else you want to say that you want to get on the record and on this film about your life or about anything? Are you, you going to give me a check or cash? <laughs> cash. You deserve cash. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just proud I'm still alive to talk about it. And I thank the good Lord every day. See, I'm getting on up in the years. Invited to speak at the high school. Oh, good. He, he, uh, yeah. Well, we're lucky to have you because I mean you're a good example to us in this room, but you're also a good example of younger people that you speak to. And I, I know Karen just mentioned that you speak at the high school. And it's so important for people to hear from gentlemen like you who went through what you went through. Yeah, but the thing about it, what's so pitiful about it? I go up and talk to those classes, and I cannot mention the Lord or the. Yeah. Uh, I try to every way I can to ease something in there, yeah. but. Um, it's a different world. If I were to mention God, some of the mamas, some of the kids would go home. Mama Dorsey said God did that. No, that'd be the end of me going to the high school. Yeah, that's that's a shame. Yeah. I, well, it's been a real honor to meet you and to hear your story. I mean, you're you're very modest, but you're a true hero for what number one the way you lived your life growing up. I mean, that was a tough life, but you realized how lucky you were to have a community like that, a father like you had. Well, that just like you learned Dad, a lot a lot of your skills growing up. Dad always said, "Take what you got and do the best you can do with it. That's sufficient." Uh, and the pitiful thing about talking to these kids, I just, no way I can get God involved in it. Because yeah. If I were to mention God, when I'm running home, tell Mama, Dorothy said God did this, and that'd yeah. be the end of it. They would never let me in the schoolhouse again. Yeah, that's a shame. But I know whatever you do tell them sticks with them. And, and I, I gotta believe they have a greater appreciation for this country after hearing you and hearing your experiences. Well, I tell them when I first started, I say, hey, when I look out there, I'm seeing what? They look at you. I say, I'm seeing future policemen. 
future lawyers, future preachers, preachers military, future politicians, future I says, you guys are the future. And how you handle it yeah. is up to you. Yeah. Because you are what we owe folks. You got to depend on for our future. And you can be worthwhile or you can be worth a not worth a crap and it's up to you. I said, you guys, I said, you're going to be our policemen, our lawyers, our everything out there. I said, we depend on you to take over when we're gone. So that's a great message. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't think of a better way to end this talk other than what you just said. And everybody that sees this is going to hear what you just said, and I know it's going to have an impact on them. And I just want to thank you for everything you've done in your life, but particularly thank you for your service. Well, <laughs> I guess I'm a little bit something, but, uh, well, I'm not either. As a human being, if I'm in coming or getting, you know, or not, I know where I'll be anywhere within 50 miles of the year and say, hey, baby, hey! <laughs> <laughs> That does it. Hey, big D. They don't call me Dorothy. Big D. Well, you've obviously had a good influence on a lot of people, and you should be proud of that. Well, I've been blessed. Yep. I've been right here on this same property all my life. Never have been hungry. Never have gone naked. Got some sorry youngins, though, especially, especially my daughter. <laughs> Just like her daddy. <laughs> yeah, like father, like daughter. He's like, look at her, and I say, oh, my poor car. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for letting us come here. I ain't doing it. Yeah, this, this was wonderful. I feel blessed to have been able to sit down and hear your story, and I know Sue does too. So thank you so much. We good? Well, that's one thing about it. I never get tired of bragging about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, yeah, well, I mean that is good because otherwise people wouldn't hear this story, and it's important to hear the story. Yeah, yeah it is. I mean, the story of your upbringing is just fascinating to me, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and obviously your, your heroism of the military. I mean, you. Yeah, well, daddy, everybody respected his dad. It was the same way when I was a little girl. I go to any store in Roswell, and I just tell him who I was. Really? And I, whatever I, you know, I was in the dime store or the drug store. Or it didn't matter, you know. Wow. Well, my daddy was, and that, that's fine. And that's you got to be proud I'm of that. Very, I mean, you should be real proud of that. Very blessed when I became a Christian, and they said, you know, you pray in Jesus, and Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do. I, I understood that completely. Yeah. Because it was that way with my dad. Yeah. Whatever, well, you, you were lucky to have that kind of upbringing. Very blessed. Very, yeah. Very blessed. Very grateful. Hey, Craig, people are funny. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't dare put on their old uniform and go, but that Memorial Day thing, I'm going full dress blue. You should. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I got to I gotta show off. <laughs> I don't blame I, you. I mean, it, had to buy a new set. My uh, first cousin borrowed my original. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never did bring it back, and he <laughs> died. That is, that's uh, bad. That's pretty bad. I, mean, I want my original uniform, but. Well, and people want to see you in your uniform. Absolutely. I mean, everybody that goes to that. They want to see you in your uniform. It, it, it inspired a lot. Yeah. Well, the thing I liked about it. I can brag about it still fit. Uh, yeah. That's something it's to brag about. Too big. Golly. It's too big now. I was yeah. in the Army in the 70s. Most guys I know my age can't fit in their uniform now. I mean, my husband described the first time he saw Daddy, he said he was standing in front of the double wide refrigerator and I could see a little of the refrigerator. Because <laughs> 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 he was just sure muscle. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I bet you, you're pretty close to the size you were. When he went in. When I'm, a, I'm lighter right now than I've been in 30 years. Wow, that's great. I stayed anywhere from uh, uh, 190 to 210 all the time, but I'm I'm down. Uh, I doubt if I weigh 185 pounds right now. But that's better than being overweight. Oh yeah, that's great. 
But I uh, can't get nobody to give me the cook me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> He's so hard to cook for. He'd be happy with beans and cornbread. Yeah. <laughs> Just give lard and cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> we did graduate Sutter. <laughs> I tell you, it's, a real, it's really great to see somebody that lives right where they lived when they were yeah. born, pretty right, much. Exactly. I mean, you don't see that much anymore. No. I mean, just living in the same town is a big well, deal now. I always loved coming here, bringing my children, so my children could play where I played. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. When we moved in with Daddy, my youngest said to me, Mom, it's just, I just can't tell you how special it is that I get to bring my children to a place that I played when I was a little girl, because we moved around all the time. She can't go back to her childhood home. So yeah. this is yeah. her, my children's memories Boy. of childhood home. That you know? is... And so they get to come back here with their children now. It's, it's yeah. really important. And the older you get, the more special that That's is. That's right, you, the more yeah. you appreciate yeah. it. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's oh. And Craig, the, that magnolia tree out there, I hate that daggone thing, but I wouldn't dare take it down because wow. the grandkids and great grandkids they love that magnolia tree. <laughs> Up they go. Is it a good climbing tree? Oh, I, I need to look at it. I, lo I saw it, but I didn't play it this. It's a great climbing tree. <laughs> it's been climbed. <laughs> it's been, it's, I'm surprised it's still standing after they all. <laughs> <laughs> I had 11, our 11, well, no, just nine of them were here over spring break, and they just about wore it out, <laughs> climbing up and down. No, you can't cut that one down. No, uh-uh. Well, that was fun. Well, thank you again. Yeah. This thank has been you. great. This is great. I'm just thrilled to have this documented. Well, you give them the mail and the rest where you can send yes, my check. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you want a check or cash? Well, maybe I'd, you better take I'd, cash. I'll, I'll take a check. <laughs> I don't know. He's a lawyer. You may uh, want to go. Yeah, that's cash. right. That's why I meant. <laughs>